Good afternoon and welcome to Operation Sisterhood Intel Hour, which is a program run by Operation Sisterhood, which is a peer support program for female veterans uh, that looks to, to introduce them to topics and um, experts in areas that will be helpful to them as they live their lives as female veterans. And tonight's Intel Hour, uh, the format will be we have um, a speaker joining us tonight who's going to talk about intimate partner violence. We are going to record her presentation, which I think will be about 40 minutes or so. And um, we will make the recording available to everyone after the fact. And then after Katie concludes her presentation, we will stop the recording, which will allow you the opportunity to um, ask Katie questions. We want you to do that. We want you to ask the expert if you have a situation that you would like advice on or um, an issue that you need some help and guidance navigating. That is our plan for the evening. So um, Operation Sisterhood Intel Hour, it is July 12th, 2023. Our uh, guest speaker tonight um, is Katie Bishop. She's a licensed social worker with extensive forensic social work and domestic violence, intimate partner violence experience. Uh, she's a skilled clinician who works with individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I'm gonna ask you if you're um, not muted to please mute yourself. I'm gonna get back to my introduction. I will tell you when, when Katie agreed to speak uh, for us tonight, we were very excited because she comes to us with a wonderful uh, reputation of understanding the female veteran population. So she has extensive um, experience in working with domestic violence and intimate partner uh, violence experiences. She is, works with individuals who have experienced all types of trauma, uh, particularly individuals who have experienced um, interpersonal, I'm sorry, um, uh, interpersonal violence and domestic violence and use of violence or aggression against an, an intimate partner. So I stumbled through your introduction, Kadeen. You are a desired speaker. Women appreciate what you have to say. I am going to stop my rambling and let you take the floor. Thank you so much. It was beautiful, done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am so honored to be here and to talk with uh, the woman veteran population regarding this very, very important topic. Um, tonight, my goal is to present on IPV to give a brief introduction of what IPV is. Then I will also give, I'll also list and go through and hopefully have a discussion about how IPV impacts women veterans in particular. And then I'll also talk about services and resources that are available for women who are experiencing IPV through the VA. So again, I'm Kadeen and I am the Intimate Partner Violence Assistance Program Coordinator for VA New Jersey's healthcare system. And just as, um, just as a background, Every single VA across the country has an intimate partner violence program assistance coordinator. So I am the one for, for New Jersey, obviously, but there is throughout the country, there is an IPV coordinator in every state. Some has two, depending on the size and the geographic location of the facility. So just as a backdrop. So tonight I first, like I stated, I wanted to start with introductions because I know Oftentimes I say IPV and everybody's like, what is that? So VA, when we wanted to do uh, intimate partner violence program, we wanted to adopt CDC terminology. So IPV is actually CDC terminology. I, the CDC wanted people to refer to intimate partner violence and not specifically domestic violence. And that was for specific reasons. One, they wanted to be you know, inclusive of all types of sexual relationships. Typically when people think of domestic violence, you think of like heterosexual relationships and they wanted to make sure that it was inclusive and everybody know that there would be space and there is treatment available for everyone. They also wanted to make sure that stalking was included. So stalking necessarily was not a reportable or an arrestable offense under domestic violence. Stalking is a reportable and an arrestable offense under IPV. And just to be specific, stalking behavior is by a current or former partner that occurs a, um, a through the continuum or frequency and severity ranging from emotional abuse to chronic severe battering or even death. So typically today we're seeing stalking in the form of internet shaming, internet bullying, cyber bullying. It's not so much an individual stalking another person. So I also get into a little bit about that, but just wanted to clear up those important definitions before we begin. 
So at VA, we wanted to use a person-centered approach to deal with IPV. We wanted to make sure that our program is destigmatized. So we never talk about perpetrators. We never talk about abusers. We only talk about individuals who use or experience violence because we wanted to make sure that either of those two individuals know that there's a place here for, at VA for treatment. And we wanted to make sure that people who are using violence also don't feel like there's a punitive measure or they can't come to us to seek help if that was the case. So it's culturally inclusive and sensitive. We use a person and environment approach and we consider the impact of trauma when designing the program. Obviously we're working with veterans. So we know that most have medical or psychological traumas that may impact them. Again, just wanted to give a pictorial depiction of IPV. So it includes sexual, psychological, physical, and again, stalking. And I think most people are familiar with the sexual and the, the, the physical forms, but not so much stalking. So stalking, I'm trying to get this so I can see because my thing is here, perfect. So stalking refers to repeated following, harassing or unwanted contact resulting in fear or self of other, fear for self or others. And again, that's texting, right? That's calling somebody a hundred times. I'm sending threatening messages. I had uh, one of the more severe cases I've seen of stalking was of uh, a veteran, a partner, because at the VA, again, just to you know, clarify, I work with veterans who are experiencing or using violence. I work with partners or veterans, and I also work with employees who are using or experiencing violence. So you don't have to be a veteran or getting services from the VA in order to receive services under the VA's IPV program. So there are several spouses who will call or um, you know, have come to the hospital with a, with a partner and will stop by with a nurse or a social worker to say, I'm experiencing IPV and I need assistance. So one such incident resulted in the spouse um, showing me pictures nude pictures of her that was used as profile pics or just used to shame her publicly by sharing those pictures with her groups, with her friends. So stalking um, typically lends itself to that kind of behavior uh, more recently. In terms of stalking, just wanted to add that approximately one in six women and one in seven men in the U.S. reported some form of stalking throughout their lifetime. One in four women experienced con contact, sexual violence, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner and reported an IPV-related incident during their lifetime. So it's pretty common. We know that statistically one in four women would have experienced a form of IPV. So whether it's sexual, psychological, um, physical, or stalking throughout their lifetime. But I think people don't realize just how prominent stalking is. So they did a study in the VA of 225 women and 64.4% reported lifetime stalking by an intimate partner. Um, cyber stalking, as I mentioned earlier, is the common trend with 66% of individuals being stalked reporting using a cyber platform. So nowadays, um, you know, we have had trainings, myself and other coordinators have had trainings regarding stalking because it is so prominent. Unfortunately, there was the death of a spouse um, by a vet veteran in Washington state that resulted from stalking and they couldn't figure out she had moved, um, she relocated, she went to Washington and they couldn't figure out um, how her partner knew where she was because he attached a GPS device under her car. So even though she traveled hundreds of miles away from home, he was tracking her every move because there was a GPS that was attached. So it's important that people understand this. Um, watching again for falling um, for, for, from a distance, spying, listening, um, devices, camera devices at home, people who have like ring cameras, or if you have security cameras that have speakers attached, it's very easy for people to listen to conversations, track your movement, you know, using technology. Technology is good, but unfortunately it also, you know, has a lot of barriers when it comes to safety and IPV. So just want people to be mindful of that. Um, I've also seen 
shared shared um, shared music apps. So for example, the Apple Music, Amazon Music, any device, Amazon accounts that you have an app and the app is perhaps linked to your partner, you can be tracked like that as well. Because I think in iPhones, they specifically ask to turn on location services you know, share family contacts and people don't understand that once that's done, as long as you have a phone attached to you, the person is still tracking you. So recently what they're suggesting is that if you are leaving an ex, you know, a spouse and you're fearful that this person can in fact, or will do some harm, it's highly recommended that you just change your phone because there are so many stuff that's going on in the phone for you to really remember every single thing that you connected or you shared with that person. So just wanted to put it out there. So examples of common stalking behaviors, again, um, using social media, sometimes utilizing other mutual friends or fake profiles to track a person's location. That's very common. People will make a fake profile. We all know how easy it is to copy and paste, right? So you can actually copy and paste someone's picture, add that picture to your profile, and you're thinking that this person is actually, you know, actually um, connected to me because they're a friend when they're just someone who's there stalking you. Tracking patterns of behavior or places frequently visited through technology. Connecting to smart devices, again, GPS, location services, Amazon Echo. That was the one I couldn't remember, but they're, they're, it's very easy for people to track you with Amazon Echo. I'm not sure of Alexa, but I know for sure there has been incidents where people have been tracked with Amazon Echo. Tapping into phone lines, intercepting calls made on cordless phones or using apps or spyware software to obtain passwords or other sensitive information. Monitoring My Healthy Vet. This is a huge one, right? Because the VA encourages the use of My Healthy Vet so that people will be able to get health record and medical information easier as opposed to you know, making an appointment or calling a doctor. You can literally have a conversation with your doctor. Just be mindful that your partner may have contact to your passwords as well. And so that's you know, no longer confidential information or could potentially put you at harm or risk. So what are the safety recommendations for stalking? What would, what would be recommended as a safety plan? So evaluate safety concerns and you know, use a trauma-informed approach. Of course, you wanna make sure that the person is safe, that this is the, whatever anxiety is caused from this is taken care of, right? Um, and also just what I'm doing, psychoeducation regarding technology and the use of technology. Um, collaborating with law enforcement, VA staff, again, Sometimes people are recommending now if you are, you know, if you're concerned that your passwords may be compromised or you use the IZs, just like really changing your phones and just making sure that you put an end to that. Uh, just brief background on the VA program. It's a brand new program. We only got started back in like 2018, so it's fairly new. So I appreciate this because this is getting the word out that we have it and the services are available. And the mission is to implement a comprehensive person-centered recovery-oriented program, again, for caregivers, employees, and veterans. So there's not many programs in the VA where the spouse can benefit, and this is actually one of them. So some significant findings as it relates to IPV and veterans. So we are finding that the national statistic for IPV is one in three or one in four women would have experienced a form of IPV throughout their life and one in four men. What we're seeing is that this is twice as likely for the veteran population. And this is of course, because there's, you know, we are veteran centric factors that make this number so high. There's, you know, veterans have issues with post-traumatic stress. However, I must caution that post-traumatic stress may be astrobated, astrobated when you have um, when you're experiencing IPV, but it does not cause IPV, because that is actually a reason why a lot of spouses 
our partners of veterans stay in abusive relationships because they say, oh, but, you know, he or she has IPV and so I can't leave, you know, this is not his fault, this is not her fault, this is because she has PTSD. Well, there are millions of veterans who have PTSD who don't abuse their partners, right? So there's a little bit more anxiety, we acknowledge that, but it doesn't cause you to use violence. So just wanted to underscore that. Um, there's military life and family stress, the separation, mental health, substance abuse. So we have all these issues, increased anger, decreased frustration tolerance, all these issues that make veterans more prone to either using or experiencing IPV. So what are the signs of IPV? How do you know that someone is experiencing IPV? So I think we all know the obvious signs, right? The bruises, the handprints, the ball spots, burns, cuts, unexplained sprains, fracture, um, fractures, soreness, stiffness, vomiting due to internal organ injury, soiled or torn bloody clothing, um, partner always comes to appointment or is hovering. So the lack of privacy, right? Not being able to do anything by yourself. You, you, you have to give an account for where you are. And there's this serious, this serious idea that I must control your movements. Um, fear or malnourishment, which is something that, you know, people may not see or consider to be part of IPV. But let's talk about the life term, the long-term effects of IPV on someone who's experiencing. So I think, again, people are more familiar with the depression, the anxiety, the self-blame. The self-blame is huge because this is a main reason why individuals stay in abusive relationships, because your self-esteem and your self-confidence is so depleted that you don't even have the energy to contemplate leaving. Um, PTSD, increase in substance use, and of course, suicide and homicide. There is a great deal of isolation that's, um, that's known, that's, at, at, that's for individuals who are experiencing, they experience a great deal of isolation. And that's because there is so much shame and guilt associating with experiencing IPV. And sometimes there is a lack of support, um, especially I think in like African-American and, and Latino populations, there is, less support or less understanding of what you're going through. You know, people are often encouraged to seek it out. It's your husband. It's your wife. Why would you leave? You live in a beautiful home. You have a nice car. He gave you a good life. You know, unfortunately, people hear these types of excuses. And then you just feel like you're all alone because everybody perceives me to be having this great life. And so I'm not. And what do I do? I'm stuck. Uh, work disruption, poverty, housing insecurity is major, right? Because if you need to leave, especially for a woman with kids, where do I go? You know, who is going to put me up? And there is this fear of retaliation from the abusive partner if you go to someone else's house. Legal issues is huge. And I must say, one of the huge, a huge barrier to leaving, again, is because oftentimes people think once you leave the relationship, the legal issues stop. And sometimes, unfortunately, it starts because then you have custody issues, you have ongoing divorce, you know, court, you have, you know, you're, you're constantly caught up in legal and court er hearings and people just get tired. So that's also, that also can be a barrier, but there is resources available and, you know, we'll get into that. The traumatization of children. So children are the silent victims of IPV. Um, people often, I guess, whether it's denial or just not really being, not, not really wanting to face exactly what's happening. I often hear um, parents say, they, the children has no idea what's going on. They're always asleep. It happens at night. I make sure that they don't hear. Children almost always hear right? Nobody who cares about a parent is going to not be attuned to the fact that they're getting hurt. So once the voices start raising and they associate that with any form of violence, kids are not going to go to sleep. They're going to stay awake in their rooms and they're going to listen to everything. So make sure it's important that if you're experiencing IPV, if you're, even after you have left the situation that you make sure that your children obtain therapy. And almost all the county DV agencies, and I'll give you a short list at the end of the presentation, almost all of them do have services available for children. And just as a caveat, every 
county in New Jersey have a domestic violence agency that provides free services for anyone who's experiencing IPV, free legal services, and most provide um, some form of safe housing as well. Um, with respect to physical symptoms, um, I think, again, there are some obvious ones. I just want to draw attention to the diabetes, the chronic pain, the IBS, irritable bowel syndromes, frequency of intestinal issues. So the gastric issues, the bloating, the IBS, all these stuff are now linked. Heart problems, which I found was interesting, are now linked to long-term effects of IPV. In terms of frequency and statistics, this was taken from the World Health Organization in 2014. So I imagine that this have increased since we're now in 2023, but 72% of all murder suicides involve an intimate partner. The CDC is now concerned with what they're calling familicide, which is when a partner takes out the entire family. So unfortunately, we're seeing less incidents of suicides and more incidents of familicides. Nine to four percent of victims of murder victims are female. And one in four women and again, a one in four men experience IPV. So this is a chronic, chronic uh, societal problem. Just I wanted to touch again on just to touch a little bit on reproductive health and IPV. So IPV significantly increase or oftentimes starts during pregnancy. And this obviously has affects the reproductive health of the child. So there is always um, some, in, some form of uh, reproduction coercion, right? Forcing the person not to use birth control. Um, a lot of women or a lot of individuals will say, but we never use birth control. We use the pull out method and the person just repeat, refused to do that so that I could get pregnant. There is higher instances instances of miscarriages, and 16% of women report being threatened or bullied into getting pregnant. 41 to 71% cease breastfeeding by four weeks, which obviously affect um, the child. And again, there is higher incidence of postpartum. Just wanted to add that this is the reason on the VA relationship health and safety screening tool that we have throughout the VA, the there, every woman who's expecting has to be screened every trimester. It's mandatory in VA and all the women's clinic do, do, do screen for IPV. Uh, just to touch a little about strangulation, I know it's kind of dark, but it's important. So strangulation is the most likely fetal form of physical violence and it's the one that will surely lead to physical violence. So 68% of women who experience IPV said that they experienced some form of strangulation. There is a 85% of death if you're strangled once and strangled a second time. So I can stress how important it is for individuals to see strangulation for what it is. It's literally a near-death encounter. Unfortunately, there is a lot of times when people will report to um, emergency rooms and they'll say that I got choked, right? So there's a difference between being choked and being strangled. So if you're choked, you swallowed something and it stops in your throat and it's blocking your air passage. If you're strangled, someone uses hands or, lit or some type of rope to tie around your neck and that is considered strangulation. And it's important because 50% of individuals who are strangled show no visible sign. So, but it can lead to severe TBI. It can lead to brain injury. So it's important that people report that you were in fact strangled and not choked. Again, 90% of all cases typically have a history with DV. And 50% of the cases of individuals who were strangled, children were present. And unfortunately, 99% of individuals who are strangled are women. Uh, just to touch base a little on VA and IPV, again, what we offer and what resources are available to women who are experiencing or using IPV. So I wanted to talk uh, just to give credit to Dr. Iverson. She's a clinical psychologist. Uh, I think she's in the Boston VA. 
And she has done some fascinating work studying the effects of IPV and women veterans. So I'm crediting a lot of the slides that I'm going to be using to her. Um, again, she, you know, her statistics hold through, holds true to the national statistics, which is one in three women would have experienced a form of IPV throughout their lifetime. She did a beautiful uh, statistical graph of IPV among veterans and non-veterans. So 33% of veterans reported that they would have experienced some form of IPV and 23.8% of non-veterans said that they reported. So you can see statistically, it is higher among the veteran population. In terms of lifetime, um, usage in a national sample. So here we have different age ranges and different forms of abuse by age range. So 55% of women said that they experienced any form. 47% said that they experienced psychological form of IPV. 35% said stalking. 29% said sexual. Um, they experienced sexual violence. And then physical violence was 21%. So unfortunately, there is not a huge difference among age ranges. So it is chronic regardless of age. This is a study of female veterans in Vision 1, which is, I think, the Boston region. And this was done in 2021, 2012, I'm sorry. So among 60 women that was surveyed, 28% again said they experienced any form. 50% reported physical forms of IPV and 50% reported that they experienced a sexual form of IPV. 63% reported psychological forms of IPV. So again, it's very prominent within the veteran population, which is why VA has made screening for IPV now man mandatory throughout all VA. Um, hospitals or medical centers. They, she also, Dr. Iveson also took a look at VA primary care patients, and she saw that 20.5% 20, 20 um, between 18 and 30 had experienced some form of IPV, 31 to between the age range of 31 to 44, 22.6%. 45 to 54, 22.2% experienced, and it was slightly less only for women who were 65 and older. But it's staggering the, the percentages when compared to the age group. I think that was just the same slide. This depicts self-reported health conditions by IPV status, which I think is significant. So the blue represents uh, individuals with IPV as opposed to individuals who do not have IPV. And you can see that statistically, there is not a significant difference at all. It's 75% it's has difficulty sleeping. 74.6% suffers from depression, bipolar, or some form of anxiety. This is for individuals who are experiencing IPV. 68% has chronic pain. 51% have had PTSD. Um, another 51% has overall poor health condition. So you can see that um, there is a significant correlation between experiencing IPV and multiple mental health conditions. Just to talk a little bit about the IPV and the LGBTQ community, um, Again, just to be sensitive, we're inclusive of everyone. We don't make assumptions. We make sure that we ask and we tailor our screenings and our treatments to suit them. Um, and, and there is no stigma attached. And we make sure that the VA is harmonious in the way we approach care for individuals who are experiencing IPV and maybe of the LGBTQ community. Again, we, just to talk a little bit about um, risk factors that correlates to IPV, women who are younger in age certainly have higher incidences, women who are lesbian or bisexual in orientation, 
um, people who have financial instability, housing instability, um, people who have had limited years of military service, and, and people who have had past histories of childhood sexual abuse or military trauma. I think I talked a little bit about the health factors. Um, this just depicted, again, a chart that just showed in terms of physical health, uh, chest pain and palpitations. We talked about IBS. Frequency of headaches is a common complaint from people who are experiencing fibromyalgia. Chronic pain is also associated with individuals who have long-term, who have experienced IPV for a long time. Um, head injuries, TBI, concussions some of the ones that we all, we all talked about. So one of the things that we hear a lot, see, I'll be perfect. One of the things that we hear a lot is why, why did you stay, right? My goal as an IPV coordinator and as someone who is really um, in this space is that instead of saying, why did we stay? I would like that to be reversed with how can we help? Because if people knew that support and help was available, people would be less inclined to use IPV because they know that there'll be public outrage, public outcry, and people would be less inclined to stay because they know that they would get support, right? So why do people stay in these abusive spaces? So we're going to break it down um, a little Again, we talked about lack of financial stability. Where are you going to go? You have children. Where am I going to live? Who's going to help, right? Um, people stay to protect pets. Oftentimes, an abusive partner, if they know that this person um, is really into pets or, you know, is really, they're, is really connected to their pets, they understand that if I hurt them, then I'm also going to severely hurt the pet. So if I hurt the pet, I'm also going to really hurt them. So they stay because they will start either mistreating the, the pet or abusing their pet before they often abuse the partner. History of being in prior abusive relationship, um, unresolved relational trauma. That is a major, major indicator for individuals or a risk factor for individuals who may be involved in future IPV relationships. So oftentimes I'll talk with women veterans or spouses of veterans and they'll say, this is my third failed marriage, I feel awful. Or this is the third person that I've ever been with who have abused me. So it's important that you get help that you get uh, treatment, you know, you seek some psychotherapy because it will help to prevent you, you know, identifying the risk factors and the barriers that led you back to abusive past. Um, very common people stay to protect their children, right? They, again, the, if they leave and the person is abusive to them, they're often thinking, and it has happened several times where the person will then, whether sexually or physically abuse the child. Um, psychological and mental entrapment caused by the cycle of abuse. So the, if, if people are familiar with the cycle of abuse and the power and control wheel, you know that there is the tension building phase, there is the act of violence, and then there's the honeymoon phase. So after every episode of abuse, there is typically a huge honeymoon phase. And the more the abuse intensifies is the more the person who's using abuse up the ante, if you will, with the honeymoon phase. So if before you was getting taken to dinners or you were gonna go, you're gonna get taken to fancy restaurants, then you may get a trip, right? You may get a car, you may get the promise of a house. So it's seemingly like this person is really trying to change or is really trying to show me that they, you know, they're sorry or for their actions. But unfortunately, it's just a cycle until it happens again. And the more the person understands who's using violence, understands that that's what they need to do to keep you calm, then they'll know exactly what to do. And you'll just live on this continuous roller coaster because you're always going to be cycling through moods of highs and lows and highs and lows until unfortunately, you know, someone gets hurt badly and then you realize this, this won't work. A lack of awareness of resources. So not everyone is aware, again, that every single county in New Jersey has a domestic violence agency and services for individuals we're experiencing and children of individuals are experiencing are absolutely free. 
So I would encourage anyone who's experiencing to call. You know, I have an extensive list that I can share and I also have a shorter list at the end of my PowerPoint. Lack of support, we talked again about individuals who just feel like I'm not gonna get the support from family or friends. You know, if I leave, I need help to pick up the kids. I need help to drop off the kids. We're gonna, who's gonna help me? So just feeling like they really don't have that support. The, the, gain, the, the guilt and the shame, again, is real from the person who's experienced and also from outside family members who may judge you for wanting to leave the relationship. Fear of being believed. We see that in the media a lot. You know, there is a famous case in the media of someone who abused his girlfriend recently, and I read the comments and I was mortified. People are saying, but she retracted her statement. It didn't happen. You know, she lied. You know, these are the sort of things that allow people to stay in abusive spaces and abusive relationship because people feel like they're not going to get the support. So she retracted the statement. Does that mean the abuse never happened? Does that mean she wasn't physically assaulted or sexually assaulted, where she coerced into rec recanting her statement? You know, people often judge the victim instead of trying to lean in and support the victim or the person who's experiencing. Uh, fear of indebtedness, particular to veterans. I've heard this a million times. He has PTSD. She has PTSD. She's a combat vet. He's a combat vet. They fought for a country. Um, they have a medical condition. They have nobody else to look, look after them. These are common um, excuses or, that are given very often throughout the VA. And again, I just wanted to state clearly that there are several veterans who have PTSD, but that's never an excuse to abuse somebody else. And nobody has the right to stay in an abusive space or to stay somewhere where they're not feeling loved, appreciated, or they're, they're, they're being hurt. So what services, uh, concrete services and supports are really offered at VA? So we do, I do case consultations with clinical staff. I have groups that I'm gonna detail briefly and I raise awareness, community awareness, which I'm doing now, community involvement. I also partner with uh, the National New Jersey Coalition to End Domestic Violence. I sit on one of their committee. I try to um, attend other DV community networking groups just so that we're aware of what shelters and resources are available to our veterans. In terms of um, specifically what is available within the VA, so my goal is to make sure that everybody understands what that there is unhealthy relationship, there is an you know, and what an abusive relationship is and what a healthy relationship looks like and to make sure that we work myself and other clinical teams work with our veteran population to make sure that people who are experiencing unhealthy relationship know that there is help available. And, you know, we often hear of unhealthy relationship, but we don't really see it. So I wanted to just put this here quickly, just to give an overview of what a healthy relationship should look like, right? So there is communicating with respect, trust, honesty, right? And there is no need for one partner or the other to control the other based on any reason. So in terms of programs, um, the VA currently offers several programs available to people who are using or experiencing violence. There is the Strength at Home program, and these are national programs that are offered throughout the country. So the Strength at Home program is an evidence-based trauma-informed group, and this is specifically for veterans who are using violence or aggression in their relationship. So it's a 12-week group. It uses motivation and interviewing to enhance um, the veteran. It's, it's, again, it's run virtually right now and it's run throughout the country. And this, I can connect individuals who are, who are using violence or feel that there's too much aggression and they wanna control that before it gets to the point where they're using violence with groups across the country. It's 12 week and they must complete at least nine week in order to get the certificate. So. One of the things that VA is doing is making sure that we work with um, the Veteran Justice Outreach Program so that courts know that we have this program and this could use um, particular for veterans who have been arrested for IPV. 
that component that group also has a couples component so this is just for couples who have been having some aggression some anger issues in their relationship and they need some they need help so again it's done virtually and i can con connect individuals who need the service with people across the country i also started the our safe our safe support group due to covid and this is a group for women or spouses of veterans who are currently ex experiencing IPV or have had issues with, hi with IPV. So currently we have like, it's an ongoing group. We have 10 women, we use a Teams format. So you can just join anonymously while you walk in the park or do grocery shopping. And it's just to provide su um, support, resources on, and information to whom they're experiencing. I've successfully helped three women through a divorce and countless others who uh, have left abusive relationships. We also have the Warrior to Soulmate program. I'm actually doing a retreat after like a three year hiatus due to COVID on August 5th and August 6th. This is going to be on the East Orange campus at the VA. And this is for couples who are having communication roadblocks, no active violence. If you have had a history of violence in a year or so, that's OK. It just can't be within the last six months. And so the veteran and their partner will convene at the VA for a weekend retreat. So it's like eight to three on Saturday, breakfast and lunch is provided Saturday and Sunday. And we'll do hands-on role playing. We'll do um, Virginia, uh, communication techniques from like Virginia Satir and other models. They'll get a handbook and cards to take home that they can use and practice after the seminar ends. And again, that's August 5th and August 6th. And you can always email me for referrals. The VA also started what we call the RICE program. And this is the only program currently that's specifically for individuals who have a history of repeatedly, um, I guess, getting involved with partners who use violence. So this is for people who have experienced IPV. It's a manualized trauma-informed individual therapy between just one person and therapist. I'm currently a trained RICE facilitator. And I'm also, and I am actually accepting referrals to the RISE program. So if you have a history or you have just left or you're still in an abusive space and feel like you could benefit from this, then this might be the program for you. Just to show you the relationship health and safety screen. Again, this is, uh, this is done. The VA came up with a screening tool to screen for IPV because we found that statistically it affected veterans and it's used for male and female veterans. So this is gonna be a standardized screening tool that you get whenever you have a physical, it's done annually and any clinician in the VA can administer the screening tool. So it's called the RHS screening tool. And I just wanted to show the questions. So it asked uh, four questions initially. Um, in the past 12 months, have you been screamed or cursed at, insulted or talked down to, threatened with harm, or, you know, to, or have been physically hurt? And it's within the past 12 months. The frequencies never, rarely, sometimes, often, or frequently. If anyone answers yes to either of these, then they do a more severe, uh, 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 they do another intense screening where they ask within the past six months. And they ask if the frequency or severity of whatever is increasing the form of violence. And again, remember I told you, we specifically ask if you have been choked or strangled because we know that the lethality rate associated with being strangled is so high. And then finally, we ask if you think that your partner might kill you. And if you say yes to either of these, a consult is generated to myself. And every packed social worker is a trained um, IPV champion, someone who I have trained that can stand in if someone says, yes, I believe my partner can kill me and I need to go to a safe house. The VA has supports provided for that. Uh, in terms of safety planning, I just wanted to mention the My Plan app. So this is an app that's on every smartphone. 
I, I am a Google, I'm an iPhone girl. So just go to your app store and put in my plan and the app will populate. Um, it, will, it will give you step-by-step safety planning tip. Um, it's done by your zip code. So it will, it will make you aware of what safe houses, what domestic violence agencies are around you for you to contact. So it's an absolutely great resource. Highly, 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 highly recommend that everyone download this app. It's called the My Plan app. And it looks like this. So I wanted to give everyone an idea so you know um, exactly what you are downloading when it pops up. I talked a little bit about resources. Um, I included the National DV hotline number, the 1-800-799-7233. That's the National DV hotline. New Jersey also has a DV hotline number for the state. And that one is 1-800-572-7233. That's New Jersey's domestic violence hotline. I have a list of a link to shelters in New Jersey. And on every single county as a DV agency that's state funded in the county. I listed a couple, but if you ever need an extensive list, I'll be happy to share that with anyone who needs it but every county has their own DV um, agency. And I just ask that you breathe. I know it's a lot. I know it's often dark in parts. I like to say that I do very dark, but meaningful work. So I just ask that you breathe. Let's just decompress for a minute and lie on a beach in Jamaica with me. <laughs> And this is my, um, my email address. So if anyone needs to reach me, that's how you can reach me.